The New Jersey Bank Marketing Association presents How to Make Sure Your Marketing Results in Sales. This seminar was recorded May 2, 2013 in Clark, New Jersey. In this program, Nicholas Maselli, Market President of TD Bank. At the lectern to introduce Mr. Maselli is Jeffrey Horn of the New Jersey Bank Marketing Association. You notice that we've had basically marketing to sales. We've spoke about how uh, a bank did it through all of their employees. We talked about marketing and sales on managing up. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Nick Maselli from TD Bank, who's going to take a different twist on marketing to sales. Uh, Nick has worked at TD Bank for 15 years. He is currently market president of the bank's Central Jersey market, comprising of Essex, Hudson, Middlesex, Morris, Somerset, and Union Counties. Previous to that, Mr. Maselli, it said Maselli, Nick, but I just thought, okay, Maselli, <laughs> and was regional vice president for Essex Hudson. Yeah, you can stop this. Don't worry about it. Okay, this is Nick. That's Here he is. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So I'm Nick Maselli, and I've worked at uh, TD Bank for 15 years. Last week was my anniversary, uh, which means that for the first 10 years of my career, I had the opportunity to work uh, directly for an individual named Vernon Hill. Does anyone know who Vernon Hill is? <laughs> so a few of you are raising your hands and nodding your heads. Um, so that was kind of interesting uh, about CEOs because I think I worked for a very unique CEO. Uh, he hired me, he was a visionary, he was um, I think one of the best marketers that I've ever met in my life. Um, but there's you know that fine line between genius and something else, right? Since it's a blog, I'm not going to say the word. Um, so as we built and, and grew, I guess I was one of those um, ants that uh, Susan referred to that was being um, running around as he was leading with an iron fist. But it was also part of what built our culture and, and what created um, you know, what does not kill you makes you stronger uh, mentality. And so. Uh, I, I think I was asked to, to really talk about how you take marketing um, from concept, uh, from that ivory tower in the carpeted office, uh, and get it out into the streets and into the, the feet of, the, of your employees that actually have to go out and execute the brand. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask a question, how many folks here actually work for a bank where they're employed by a bank? If you could just raise your hand. Okay, and, and how many of you support a bank um, by, by working, you know, you're not employed by them, but you're a consultant to them. Okay, just again, understand. So, I think it starts um, at least at, at TD uh, and, and formerly at Commerce with three things, which is your model, your brand, and your culture. And I'm not a marketing person, although I graduated Rutgers with a degree in marketing, um, I'm a banker. Uh, that's what I do. My day-to-day -day is I, I run the market. I have 78 stores. I've got four commercial lending teams that are out in that footprint. I've got a middle market lending team that's out in that footprint. Um, and you know, the, the, or my job is to make sure that um, we're bringing in new clients, whether it be commercial, whether it be a consumer, uh, that the customer experience at our stores is one in which you know, we, are, uh, cr we create fans, not customers. right? So, so what's the difference between creating a fan versus a customer? Go ahead. Someone's going to advocate for your brand. Right? It's creating that advocate. Isn't it better to have a bunch of fans out there running around talking about what great experiences they had in your stores? <coughs> now, if someone has a good experience in one of your stores, branches, I'm going to say stores because it's brainwashed in me. How many people do you think they're going to tell about that good experience? They're going to tell probably a handful, four or five people, about the good experience they had. Now, if they have a bad experience in your store, how many people are they going to tell? Every person they possibly can, right? So you've got to make sure that that model brand and culture is not something that's just words on a screen. That's why I don't, I'm not a marketing guy, so I don't even have a PowerPoint, right? That model brand and culture is something that becomes part 
of the fabric of your organization. So you've got to ask your questions. Who are we? Why are we? And where are we going? When you think about culture, training has something to do with it. But before you can even train them, you've got to hire them. Right? So when you're hiring them, we hire for attitude. We, you know, we'll teach you how to be a banker. We'll teach you how to engage, how to, how to, how to get on the tele line, open up a box, right? Opening store opening procedures, compliance issues, right? But we can't teach you that attitude. Susan mentioned about greetings. How often do we see that experience where someone gets up from around their desk, makes that time, extends a hand, and says, hello, how can I help you? And, or, how many times do we see the invisible customer, right? So what's the invisible customer? The invisible customer is, I walk in to do my banking, and the CSR picks up the phone, and the, the teller's got a line, and they're worried about this, and, and, the, other, and the assistant manager is dealing with a client, and, and no one acknowledges the customer, right? Because, oh my god, if, they, if I make eye contact with them, I, I might have to talk to them. So something I probably shouldn't share with you, but um, I am, uh, is that we're getting away from greetings. Who here has tried to get into a mall to do some shopping and ran into a greeter? Right? We all have done it. And how do you feel when you meet that greeter? Annoyed, right? So anyone else? Anyone feel good when that greeter says, hi, welcome to Agricomery and Fitch? Anyone? You like it. Well, you know what? You, you, take, a company, you take a company like Apple. Yes. It's the way you do it. Correct. You go into Walmart, and it almost, they're prompted to, you know, they have that frown on their face. Right. They're not really interacting. You're like, oh, they're just They don't want to be there, right? I got to stand here and talk to people. <laughs> you see that right away, don't you? You feel it. So it's a subtle little change, but isn't there a big difference between a greeting and a warm welcome? We ask people to greet. We, don't, we no longer do that. We're asking everyone to provide a warm welcome and a fond farewell. And there's a big difference, right? That's the apple, warm welcome. How can I help you? I don't, who here has been to one of these crazy Apple stores? It's a disaster. There are people everywhere. It's packed. There's people talking about things. There's people on computers, right? But how quickly do you get in and out of that place? You walk in, someone comes up to you, usually got a beard, a tattoo, a couple of <laughs> earrings in his ear, right? Right? And you're like, okay, I'm about to buy a thousand dollar piece of equipment, and I'm, and you have a, you're, you're you're welcomed. You have a conversation. No problem, they take this little thing, they, they, oh, what do you want, boom, we got it, okay, no problem, give me your credit card, slice, here's your receipt, okay, and you're out of there, right? What has Apple created? Have they created customers? No, they're creating fans, right? And fans go out and tell people about things. So at TD, when a new employee makes it through our process to bring in, what do you think the first thing, they, their, their first day in, the, in, in their job, where, what, what do we do? How do they spend their day, that first day? I'm sorry? Warm welcomers. Warm welcomers, they spend their first day, any employee, whether you are from a male person to a teller to a vice president to a senior vice president to an executive vice president, Every single person starts their first day of employment on a Monday, and they must spend it at TD University in what we call our two-day traditions course. And for two days, they learn not about banking, not about how to open a box. They learn about the culture and the tradition that is TD Bank, who our customers are, who our employees are, that there are no silos at the bank. No silos. I don't run retail. I don't run commercial. I don't run. I run the market. So that means I have 
retail ops reporting into me, I have the stores reporting to me, I have the commercial lending department reporting to me, I have advertising reporting to me, marketing is reporting to me, local market. Why? Because it's one bank. So that if someone comes up to me and says, oh, I see, you, you, know, you walk in, you wear, you, we, wear our, we wear our pins. Oh, you work at TD Bank. Oh. I was in one of your stores, and da, 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 da. I can't say I'm in commercial lending. I don't know anything about the stores. Everyone works at the same place, and we believe strongly that our internal customers and our external customers are one and the same. So whether I'm back office or front office, the culture is, who is my customer? And your employees need to know that, but they need to feel it, and they need to be empowered to be able to help and support. How many times does someone call backroom operations and they get that person who is just, oh, now I gotta talk to you, mm. right? What kind of experience do they have? We, have? we call wow experiences, right? We wanna wow our customers, we wanna wow our employees. So it's important that we spend time training our people on what their expectations are gonna be when they do learn how to open a box, when they do know, learn how to, how to manage a store. So that we're all coming from that same footprint. So we talked about model, our brand, our culture. So when we have our marketing plans and we now need to push them out into the field, there's, there's lots of different polls on marketing, right? There's um, sponsorship, who here gets lots of requests for sponsorship? $5,000 for this, $2,000 for that, $10,000 for this. All great causes, right? And where do those come from? Do they come from, do they come directly from the organizations or do they tend to come in from the field? Both? I find that the majority seems to come in from the field where we've got our local people doing the right thing, getting involved in the community, getting out and engaging, and they then get the, the ask. Hey, can you sponsor our X, right? It's a really great event. So as a, as a marketer as in marketing, it's really, you know, as tough as it is to write the check in today's environment of expense controls, it's sometimes easier just to write the check, isn't it? Insert your name here, boom, done. We're gonna get a banner ad, boom, send it out, right? Isn't that sometimes, it, it's, it's a lot more difficult to actually push back a little bit and say, well, well, what is this event all about? And it's nice that we're gonna be able to give them their check and give them their donation, but how can we really leverage this? What is the return on investment, right? We're all trying to measure that return on investment. And in order to get the, the, the line to be engaged in that, doesn't the line have to have some ownership in, in, in what you're looking to try to do? Doesn't the line have to be involved in the planning? Because what I find is that if we just write the check and send it, we don't tend to, to become involved in the event. It just kind of happens. However, if we can, let's meet with that group. Let's get an understanding of what their goals are. And what are your goals? So what are, what are, what are your store goals, right? What are this, the, the, your bank's goals? What do you want to achieve? You want new customers, right? You want deep and wallet share of existing customers. You want to increase market share within the footprint. And you want to bring on, in, on profitable business, right? Is there anything, what am I missing? Is there anything else that, that you're looking with your marketing plans to try and, and oh, you want to build a brand, right? So the line is only gonna go out and execute if they really feel that they can, that they, they get, they buy in, that they believe in it. So how do we do that? So one's by trying to, to understand their needs, their goals, and align our marketing initiatives towards that. Now recently, uh, TD separated ways with Regis and Kelly, and we started a campaign, I hope you've seen someone, some of you have seen, it's called Bank Human. Right, and that was part of our model brand and culture. What is it about? Banking human. So who has seen the commercials? All right, so there's things around, uh, you know, my, one of my favorites is the pen. Yep. <laughs> right, everyone likes the pen, right? Now, most banks chain their pens to the desk, right? 
because God forbid someone takes our pen from the check writing station. Oh my goodness, right? And most of the time, those pens don't work anyway. <laughs> Correct? The, the coveted pen that we're trying to protect with the chain <laughs> hasn't had ink in it probably in a couple weeks. So we decided to give out pens. Right? Now let's go back to Vernon Hill, right? Why? Why would we want to go out and hand out free pens? Right at our check writer station, we fill them up. Why? How much does it cost us for a pen? Who here sees those pens out in the market? They're everywhere. All right? Where do you see them? You see them in other banks. You do. You do. You see them everywhere. You go to the dry cleaners. They got the pens. I actually went to a, 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 a sushi restaurant in Edison, and they had our green giveaway pen chained to their desk. <laughs> I had to take a picture of it. I'm like, this, look at this. They're taking our pens, and they're chaining them to their desk. That's how much they value those pens. Is that crazy? You see them everywhere. The turnstiles. Right? Why do we have them? Why do we force people through those cattle lines? What does it do? It just makes people feel like they're in a cattle line. It's amazing. People are a little, actually smarter than we all think. They can actually get in line by themselves. They don't need to have these things moving, these velvet rope things. They can actually figure it out. And I can tell you, in the 15 years that I've been working, for TD Bank, we have never had a fight in the lobby because someone's going in front of somebody else. It's never happened. Why do we do it? Because it's the way we always did it. Right? So we made a commercial about it. The guy walking back and forth through the line, he finally gets up. How about our bank hours? Now, bank hours cost you money, right? There's no question about it. But we got to think about when and where our customers want to bank with us. We got to be convenient, right? If our model is service and convenient, right? What's our, America's most convenient bank, right? It's all about service, customer experience. So build your model, brand, and culture, but then you have to make sure that your employees live it. And Susan talked a little bit about, you know, the CEO that sits up in the ivory tower. Right? <laughs> How many of us in this room tend to sit in our ivory tower sometimes? I know I'm guilty of it. And how important is it when we get out into the stores ourselves? So, you know, who here goes out into the stores and meets and sees and experiences? Maybe you sit in a conference room at a store and watch customers coming in and out, right? Who here goes out into the stores? You gotta do it. They've gotta see you there. They've gotta, see, and you've gotta be engaged. And you've gotta, um, they hate when I come to the stores. They really do. Because I walk in, the store, well, the employees love it. The store managers hate it, right? Because they know what's gonna happen. I typically walk in with a handful of garbage that I picked up in the parking lot as I got out of my car, right? And I get, that must have just, every time. That wasn't there this morning. Now, it's usually around 9, 30, 10 o'clock, right? And I'm usually walking in with like an empty um, ice cream container that's got a couple ants in it um, and um, a bottle of like, um, cheap vodka, like empty, right? Um, so I'm walking in with this stuff that I found in the parking lot, and I get that wasn't there this morning. So that means that there's a whole bunch of people that are drinking alcohol and ice cream at 9 o'clock in the morning and deciding to dump it in the middle of the parking lot. Right? So we have to lead by example. Susan mentioned that before, right? So we have to do it ourselves. But that also means that our store managers have to lead by example. So we spend all this money for the event, right? And the event could be a chamber of commerce thing, it could be, 
And it could be a concert series, right? All kinds of things that we want to engage and be a part of. So then we have the dreaded booth, right? <laughs> <laughs> we paid all this money for what? To put our name on a couple websites, all this stuff. But where do we really want to get? We want to have our employees, right? What's the difference between all of our banks? We're all pretty much doing the same thing. We got the same products, we got the same services, right? What di what, if I were to ask all of you, what differentiates your bank from every other's bank, what would it be? People, right? So we all try to differentiate ourselves by the same thing, which is our people, and we take great pride in our people. So now, we paid all this money to go to this event, whether it be a trade show, whether it be a concert, and we're gonna set up the booth or the table it's really important to be there. It's really important to choose. Who are we choosing to send to the booth? Are we paying them? Right, that's a big issue. Right, we got hourly employees and it's a Saturday and we're gonna ask volunteers to come work the booth. Are we paying them or aren't we paying them? I don't know. That's a question. Do they do it because they want to buy in, because they see the value, and because they know they're going to walk away with a bunch of leads? Well, maybe. Maybe they're willing to give up and volunteer their time. Or maybe they're just like, I can't believe I got to sit here all day. So when we, when we, we talk, you know, we got to ask ourselves some questions when we set up that booth. And we've got to teach our people what it means to work that booth. We just assume that they're going to be naturally engaging, and they're going to follow up on all their leads, and it's going to be a wonderful event. And we're going to do it for the next 20 years in a row because we did it last year, so we gotta do it this year. <laughs> right? So we send our people out there. It's so important that you be there. It's so important that the leadership, you know, we talk, Susan's talking about being a leader. You gotta be a leader. Everyone's gotta be a leader. And you, so you gotta send your leaders. You gotta send people that wanna be there. You gotta send people that wanna engage with the public. Or are they gonna stand, uh, maybe they're gonna sit, behind the booth, sit there, they're gonna have half their breakfast out on the table, they're gonna have a, a, spew, a bunch of giveaways. Sure, take whatever you want, shake, take whatever you want, take whatever you want. How many people have seen that trade, so, trade show booth or that tabling? We, we all table. What are we giving away? Oh, we're giving away this. What's the takeaway? We want, we want something to leave behind? I'm struggling with that right now in our marketing plans. <coughs> Do people wanna go to New Jersey Performing Arts Center to go see a jazz festival that's sponsored by TD Bank and sign up for free checking. I really don't think so, right? But we do it, right? That's what we do. We have our folks talk, oh, we got great checking products. Let me tell you about our checking products. I'm here to go see a jazz festival. I don't want to talk to you. Thanks, banker. Yeah, I bank with you. It's good, right? So what are we doing? And then we're, we're spending valuable resources and time and we're giving them out all this stuff and we're giving them all kinds of you know, brochures to take home, takeaways. Does it really, is there really value? Or do we really want to take the person who's behind this, clean up this thing, get the breakfast, get the coffee cups out, right? We talk about what it, what, what is it your brand? Do you want your brand to look like a bunch of folks not dressed up correctly, short tails hanging out of their, out of their pants? Or you want them in front, right? You want them in front of the table. Or maybe forget about the table, right? Get them in front and you want them engaging with people, talking with people, helping with people. Maybe instead of having a table, you have them help the cause, help the event, right? They're always looking for volunteers. They always need help. So why not have them actually do something, right? Let me, I'll take people from here. Your job is to take people, from, it's raining out, so we're gonna get a bunch of TD Bank umbrellas and we're gonna send you into the parking lot and when people park their cars, you're gonna walk them back and forth so that they don't have to walk in the rain, okay? Why do you wanna do that? Is it nice? Sure. Is someone gonna remember it? Sure. I now have someone standing next to me for five, 10 minutes as we walk through the rain and I can tell them about our bank. Now, I've gotta have the right people doing it. I've got to train them how to do that. I've got to, is it easy to speak to people that you've never met before? Who likes doing that? A couple people. <laughs> well, there's gonna be another course than that. <laughs> is it easy at first, the first time you do it? It's easy? Well, the first time you started doing it, was it easy? You always found it easy? Yeah. 
you are unique, right? I would think there are a lot of other, and that's great. There are probably a lot of people that find it a little difficult, right? So we have to help people learn how to ask questions to build rapport, and it's about role playing. Who here role plays with their people? Couple hands. The importance of role planning, I mean, I think about the first time I had to speak publicly. It was, I, I think I was 22 years old, I was working for a bank, and it was an event, it was a meet and greet, and TD Bank had sponsored the meet and greet luncheon, this lunch and learn, and I'll tell you how long ago it was, my giveaway was a VCR. <laughs> And, and I would run to Crazy Eddie's, and I would buy a VCR on my way down to the event, and we'd auction off the VCR, right? So I'm standing there with the VCR box, and I'm telling you about the products and services of the TD Bank, and I completely lost the audience, right? And, and I was umming, and this and that, and I said, that's never gonna happen to me again. And so I had to work at it. And the second time, it was equally difficult. And each time, it got better and better. So, Think about our folks that are working in the stores that are delivering your brand. Do they have training in public speaking? Do they have training in how to engage and speak to people? So we're asking them to do something that's kind of outside of their comfort zone, aren't we? And if we don't help them to get there, we're never gonna have an effective marketing um, execution with, within your footprint. And you're always gonna be struggling how come our marketing doesn't work? How come we can't get the line to be engaged? How come we can't get them excited about it, right? Is that, you, you see that, you feel that, don't you? you? You do all this work, you get this up, and then you, you need volunteers to go work it. And nobody wants to volunteer, do they? So one of the things I always ask for, if I can't make it, is I wanna see pictures of the event. Now I wanna see pictures of the event for a couple of reasons. I wanna see pictures of the event because I want to look and see what that table really looks like. I want to make sure there's no ashtrays sitting there. I want to make sure that the, that the Dunkin' Donuts coffee isn't there. All the things we talk about, I want to make sure that the people, you know, how do they dress, right? These are decisions we have to make. Do we dress in business suits? Do we dress in golf shirts? How do we want it, right? But it's got to be consistent. It's, gotta, it's your brand. This is your brand. This is what you want everyone to look and feel, you, to, to, to walk away and say, wow, I got to go check out that bank, right? That's what you want at the end of the day for those events, to drive the marketing plan. All right, now I have to go to my notes. I gotta, I gotta see more of Sorry, so we're talking about events, and I told you about my VCR story, right? So we get the VCR and people would throw in their business cards. So who does things like that where they have the, the box that they want customers to fill out something, call me back? Everyone kind of, kind of do that? Okay, so after the event, and it's also important for the leadership team to stay and clean up after the event. Don't leave it to the two guys that happen to be the last folks to work the event. The lead, your team needs to see you and the leaders helping, packing up boxes, closing up the tent, putting it together and pack. That's a leader, right? They're willing to, it's like, why do I pick up the garbage in the stores? Because I like picking up garbage in the stores? No, because I'm trying to make it, I'm trying to set an example that if I can pick this up when I come into the store and get my hands dirty, you can too. So we need, our. our the, our leaders need to, to, to get dirty. They need to be involved from the beginning to the end. And that takes time, right? It takes time away from our families, right? But how do I do it? Sometimes I bring my family with me. They come to the event, I bring my boys. 12 years old twins drive me crazy. <laughs> Not as much as my 15 year old daughter. <laughs> but they come to the events and they know, hey, we're working. They come to store openings with me. Right, and I would give them something to do, fill this, do that, go fill up, fill up the pens, right? Because everyone's giving away all those pens, they gotta keep filling them up. <laughs> so I bring my family with me, and they know. It's part of what we do, it's, it's our family. So afterwards you got this big box of stuff, 
and you feel great about it, right? Look at all this stuff. I got a box full of stuff, all these names. This is awesome. All right, what do we do with it? Where does it go? It goes in someone's trunk is what happens. The box of names. But then somebody else needs the box. So they take all the names out of the box and they put it in a, in a, in a bag. And where does that bag go? It probably stays in the trunk for a little while. With all those, oh, you know where, where it stays with? It stays in the trunk with all those journal ads that you guys paid so much money for when people go to those golf events and those galas and they get the journal, right, with all the information, all the advertisements that you struggle over. What's our message? What are we going to say in this, in, this, in this gala, right? And then what happens to that? It throws in the trunk next to the umbrellas. So how are, how are we measuring our ROI? We just spent this whole time trying to get leads, trying to get information, trying to get, right, why are we doing this, customers? And we've got a whole box full of them, and what happens to it? It's forgotten. And we feel good about it because we actually, we did something. We went out, we saw people, we were engaging. We, you, people, you feel good. Everyone's like, oh, we're, we're, we're marketing, this is great. Right? But it's the follow-up after that. So you gotta get those names. Someone's gotta own those names. Well, there's a lot of names. I got all these people, and I covered you know, the, the Demarest office, and you know, these people are from all over New Jersey. I can't, you know, I want. So it's got, you gotta get rid of the I, right? And it's gonna be about the we. Who's gonna take ownership for this event? Who's gonna take ownership to, to go through those names? Oh, I gotta put it in Excel. That's gonna take me forever. <laughs> There's no easy way to do that, right? You know, we get it. The card reader is great if you're collecting business cards, but you know, business cards don't. It, it gives you a name, but it doesn't really tell you about what the person wants, right? So we do little ballots, right? This is I'm interested in whatever mortgages, residential, consumer, checking accounts, right? And people check that all off. Everyone do anyone do that, right? Anyone talk to your compliance po folks about calling those people afterwards? What do you think your compliance people are going to say? <laughs> You're going to call those people that do not call this, right? <laughs> Mailing list. Mailing. It, it, it. So you got to get around that, right? You got to work through that because that's a challenge. You know, we're, we are in a regulated industry, in a regulated world. And, you know, regulation is good for us to some extent, but the pendulum is like swung, right? <laughs> so what are you going to do with that list? You have to be really careful about how you use that list, what you do with that list. But please don't leave it in the trunk. Someone's got to own it. Someone's got to follow up on it. And then someone's got to be in charge of inspecting to make sure that it happens. Because I have wonderfully great employees that, I'll take it, I, I got it, I, I got it, I'll take it. I'm like, that's great, a month later. So what'd you ever do with that list? Uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, we started the other campaign and then I uh, started working on this project. 30 days has gone by. All that information that someone was interested in, it's gone. And someone else, one of our competitors, somebody else in this room is now banking them, right? Because they, they, they followed up on the lead. I mean, you, someone checks off, I'm interested in mortgages. Where are mortgage rates right now? Pretty low, <laughs> right? Where are most people's mortgages? I would bet people in this room, myself included, have a mortgage that's currently higher than it could be. Why? Because <coughs> I work at the bank. How many times do you guys carry checks around for gifts that your kids got, right? And your spouse says, did you deposit that yet? You work at the bank. I, oh, I didn't get a chance to. I carry around all the time. I got like three or four checks that someone, your grandma sent something. I work at the bank. I don't do it. So there's a great opportunity. If someone says, I want to refinance my mortgage, now's the time to do it, not 30 days from now. Well, the rates may even be lower. I hope not. <laughs> All right, oh, breathing into the microphone. Um, so it, how, does, how do we do this at the bank? Um, you know, and I know some of you are from all different size banks, right? Um, so we have field marketing managers uh, locally. Uh, field market manager reports to me. Um, they, it, it, they will have probably 60 to, to 90 stores on average that, that, that they cover in a market. Um, we expect them to be in the field. We expect them to be um, on the ground. They are the keepers of the brand. Um, you know, we're, we're all keepers of the brand, but people have to recognize that they, you know, 
that we, we keep the brand. And our job is protected. They go into our stores, they visit our stores, and make sure that you know, there's no tape on the walls, you know, we're not allowed to have, you know, it's the look and feel, right? There, it's, it's things. So, and we love to tape stuff up on our walls, don't we? And we just, we love it. All kind of compliance signs, don't, you, don't use the copier, you know, <laughs> clean up after you use the sink, right? I mean, or, right? Don't, throw, don't, don't flush things down the toilet. I mean, there's, we put signs everywhere. We hate signs. No signs. Not allowed to have a sign. No tape. In fact, I went almost so far as I was going to remove all the tape from all the stores. Because I'd go through, we'd clean up all the stuff, the walls would look great, I'd come back a week later, there's tape everywhere. But, but that's, you know, it's your look and feel. You, it, so they are the keeper of the brand. They walk through the parking lots, they look through, you know, making, because the store managers are responsible for it. But, you know, like our own house, if you were to come to my house right now, I guarantee you, you would walk in and say, boy, that wall really needs to be painted. When was the last time they put a, paint, a, coat, on that, a, a coat of paint on that wall, right? We all have it, right? We walk by it every day and you don't see it. So it's important for, you, for people to go outside, who are outside the footprint, who, are, who take ownership to walk through with a checklist. And, and I, you know, we walk through with a checklist and we take pictures, right? And they love when I send the pictures out to others. <laughs> and I you know, try to protect the innocent. I won't tell you what story this came from, but look what this back office looks like. Look what this desk looks like. Sometimes they take pictures of my desk and sending it out. But that's why I have to lead by example and I have to have my desk looking the way it should. So when people come up into my office, they say, well, if Nick can live this way, then why can't everybody else? So I went through a huge product. We called it RAFT. And RAFT stood for Recycle, Archive, File, and Throw Away. And because I looked around my office, and my office was a disaster. There was, and I looked around the lender's offices, and talk about a compliance nightmare. <laughs> lenders are pack rats, right? Who knows lenders, right? right? Lenders, they save everything. They have five, we, and no matter how much electronic imaging stuff you give them, what do they do? Just pile it up on the back. So we've got customer information. So we went through and we actually, we filled up 75 of those dumpsters within my market. Got rid of everything, everything. And then we had the store managers come in. Said, we're not gonna ask you to do anything that we're not gonna do ourselves. So we fixed it first in the back office. Now you gotta take this and you gotta go fix this in the front office. Because I would go into stores and who here has worked at a bank that had been, has been acquired or merged with another bank? Most people, right? It's amazing the stuff that people save. Banks three years earlier, or, I'm sorry, three banks earlier, tickets. Like, why are we saving these tickets from United Jersey Bank? You know, <laughs> you, we never even were United Jersey Bank. Yeah, but I used to work at United Jersey Bank and I took my files with me. <laughs> gotta throw this stuff out, right? Gotta clean it up. So, they, they, they cover 60 to 90 stores. Um, they reside in the market. They work in the market. They are the keeper of our brands. They understand the store goals. And they sit down with the store leaders and they talk about where they're having difficulties, where they're having issues. And then we design our plan around those issues. Um, that field marketing manager approves all sponsorships jointly with me. So the stores don't, they have budgets, but nothing gets done unless the field marketing manager reviews it and helps to try to solidify, and, and not just because we're trying to create an empire, it's about consistency of brand, consistency of look, consistency of feel, and leverage from other events that we've done. Because you can really do that, right? I mean, what works in one market, I, I cover central New Jersey, so I'm not covering, you know, the US. So what, what, what works in, not yet, what, what, what works in Middlesex is going to work in Essex, right? Now there's different pockets, different demographics, but for the most part to try it so we share best practices, right, so, to make a consistent look and feel. Because people are extremely well intended, right? They want to go out and do the right thing, but sometimes you go out and you're like, oh my god, what were they thinking, right? So to keep that consistency of brand, look, model, feel, model brand and culture, Everything gets put through us, and also so I can push back. And we can say, it's not just me, we have regional retail market managers that support the stores. Why are we doing this event? Well, they're great customers. Who's heard that? Why, we have, the why, why are we doing this? Oh, because they're great customers. 
Well, if, if we don't do this, XYZ Bank's gonna do it. And then they're gonna move their deposits. Really? Is that the only reason why, if, if that is the only reason why a customer is staying with you because you spend $5,000 to support their fireworks, do we really want that customer? I'm not so sure, right? What have we built? Or, well, we're trying to get into this bank. We're trying to get into them. We need $5,000. It's gonna help us get in. So sometimes we'll say yes, right? Do it right. And then a year later, they come back in. Hey, Denville wants us to sponsor their parade. I'm like, okay, but well, we sponsored it last year, didn't we? Yes, it was wonderful. We had so much fun. We, we marched in the parade. Okay, so are we any closer to getting their business? What have we, what have we gained as a result of that? Well, you know, not too much, but, um, but, but this year, if we do it this year, we just fail. Right? How many, but how many times do we hear that? All right, we'll do it again. You're the keeper of the brand. It's, you know, we're the keepers of the dollars. They are so, so difficult to get those dollars, right? And spend those dollars. We really got, need to make sure that we're spending them efficiently and that we're getting a return on investment. Talked about store visits. Talked about tables looking, getting your hands dirty, raffle cards. After the event, do we debrief? Do we sit down and talk about the event and say, was this a good event, was this a bad event? What could we have done differently? And should we do it again? Would we do this again? If this was to happen, were we? I mean, we've done some things in Atlantic City. I've just been crazy. You know, you're, by the time you rent all the stuff, you bring the things, you get down there, you have the event, and, and all your employees that you send down there, right? How much time did they really spend at the booth or the event? As little as possible, <laughs> right? As soon as they can get out, they're gone, right? I know, because I was one of them. <laughs> That's why it's important for leadership to be there, to hold people accountable, have jobs, what you need to do. But after the event, you got to debrief after the event. Anyone here from the Fuel Merchants Association? So. We did an event for the Fuel Merchants Association, and it was, it was extremely expensive for us to do. And we did it for like four years in a row. And I love the Fuel Merchants Association. We have a lot of great clients that are in that market. But the next year, they finally came up, and I said, we, we, we were able to calculate that we had obtained two clients as a result of doing the sponsorship for four years. What's the return on investment? And so we had a really tough conversation with them. Said, so we love you, we love your organization, we have lots of clients that are here, but this just doesn't make sense for us any longer. We have to be able to have those tough conversations. And I know you all have those tough conversations as well. I think I may have hit everything that I wanted to do. Any questions for me? the compliance issues, how do you follow up with all those things that are stuffed in the ballot box? So that, always seems, that seems to be a real problem. I'll, I'll, ask the, I'll answer the last question first, I guess. We're still struggling with it. We have not, we have not figured it out. Um, it's, um, it's a challenge. Um, these people handed us something and said, and you know, we're changing the way the ballot reads. And I don't know if that's going to be the, you know, the because now we've got the attorneys looking at it, we've got the marketing people, we've got the public relations people. So you know, I'm sure it's going to be, you know, the ballot is going to probably be this big now. You know, you're not gonna be, we have to get bigger boxes because you know, the slot's not going to be big enough to stuff Do, it in. Doesn't the, the ballot give them permission yeah, yeah, for you? Doesn't the ballot give them permission for you to contact them? That is the direction that they're headed. So some sort of permission that they are agreeing to allow us to reach out to them as a result of handing them. So that's, that's the direction that we're going. Um, successful events. You know, it's tough. It's tough. First of all, it's tough to measure the, the success of events, right? Um, I'm trying to think. You know, anytime I can go to an event and I see people engaging out in front of the table, having conversations, um, 
when I start hearing from customers, I was at this event, I saw your people, and I gotta tell you, they were completely engaged. When I go out to prospects and they say, um, you know, they were at this chamber event, at, you, know, you know who's doing a, a tremendous job of it right now? Investors. I am hearing nothing but positive things about if the people and investors. It's made me rethink who we're sending to events. You know, why? Because they're, 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 their folks are everywhere, right? Are we seeing them? Right, don't you see the, the, the people everywhere? They're everywhere, they're engaged, they're following up, they're focused. I mean, that's what, it, that's what it's all about. So, you know, successful events, it's tough, it still is tough to get, to, to, to gauge. Uh, I worked really hard to put um, the TD Bank James Moody Democracy Jazz Festival together at New Jersey PAC last year. And um, that felt good. It, um, we had, but why? Because, you know, we did events pre-show, after show, we did meet and greets with the artists, we did uh, a VIP party beforehand where we invited prospects and customers to engage. Um, where, where, we, where I find that there's value is where we're, we're, we're adding value. It's not just we're handing them a, a, a uh, here's our products and services. It's where we're building relationships. It's where we're, we're entertaining clients, but in a, in a fashion where they get to learn a little bit about the bank, they're engaged with employees, um, and I'm mixing prospects and customers when I do VIP events. Um, few customers and lots of prospects so that, um, and that's a challenge in and of itself, right? Managing the guest list, who's coming, who's not coming, I'm, you know, who your prospects are, who aren't your prospects, how do you qualify a prospect, right? And store managers, idea of a prospect is a little different than perhaps maybe a commercial lenders and everyone's got, so that's a challenge, but if you can, um, you know, if I can create events like that where um, they seem to be they are smaller but more meaningful, they're impactful, um, and people also um, we're doing events where we're putting clients, new client um, dinners or lunches. So instead of having the closing dinner that you would typically have with a client after you close their loan, you bring them and you and maybe the attorneys that closed it. Instead of doing that, we're doing a client dinners, a new client dinners. So we'll invite the CEO of maybe eight or nine new clients go to a restaurant, typically a customer, because we actually do lend to restaurants. Um, and, and we try to put the groups together so that there's common synergies, right? So they're either in the food business or they're in something, you know, they're manufacturing, but along similar lines. So we're starting to help them network. Um, and that seems to have been, seems to be working really well because they can share stories, they can share, um, and we're adding value. We're not just the bank that provided them the loan, we're actually a bank that's now helping them enhance their business and do more business. I don't know if I really answered your question, but. Any other questions? When TD took over Commerce, Commerce's brand was phenomenal. Everybody marveled about it. Did, and it seems like TD is America's most convenient bank. Everything that Commerce stood for, TD. TD was big in New England. Did, was there any training of existing TD employees to accept that brand that they acquired? The, um, it was a huge concern for the bank, right? We were merging it's really two banks, but actually three banks, because there was Bank North that was up in New England that had been acquired by TD about a year earlier, and then there was Commerce Bank um, that was mostly in the central part of the, of the states and down through Florida. And Bank North was 27 banks that had been acquired over 10 years. So for those of you who have been in that, <laughs> there's lots of cultures. There's lots of different ways of doing business. And, and, and their methodology and approach to customer service was not necessarily the same as ours. Ours, I hate to say that. So then there was Commerce Bank that had one model brand culture from you know, essentially New Jersey, New York area down. Um, but TD was, you know, it, it's an extremely well-run, organized, methodical bank. And what they were not going to say, I had been, you know, I, I was with United Jersey Bank when it became Flea. I was, um, no, um, Summit. I was with Bank of America when it became, uh, Nat West when it became Fleet. They're all Bank of America. So I was on both sides of an, of an acquisition, when we were being acquired and when um, we were acquiring. And both times that I went through that, 
it was, it was real simple. They said, um, hey, you've got a great bank there that, that we just acquired, um, but, but, but here is your new policies and procedures. This is the way we do it at this bank. And they threw away everything that was good about the bank that they acquired. TD did not want to do that, so they said, we're going to create the better bank. And that bothered me as a former commerce bank employee, the better bank. Why would I want to be a better bank? I want to be the best bank. We were, we were commerce bank. We were the best bank. We were the but you know, one of, the exec, one of my mentors took me aside and said, you're right. We want to be the best. But once you become the best, what's going to happen? You're going to rest on your laurels, and somebody else is going to become better. So we want to always strive to be the better bank. So what they did was they looked at the cultures of Bank North, of Commerce Bank, and up TD Bank up in Canada. And they said, let's take our time and let's create what will be our model. Now, a lot of the things, a lot of the looks and feels ended up being commerce. But in the end, it was because we all worked together to put it together. It wasn't that we went up and said, this is how you're going to answer the phone now. This is how, that's not how we did it. So by getting everybody's involvement and buy-in um, and creating what the model was going to be and then executing it, it allowed us, I think, to retain a lot of the great things that kept us or that, that made us America's most convenient bank. So it was a combination. Any other questions? All right, I thank you for your attention. Even the compliance issues, how do you follow up with all those things that are stuffed in the ballot box? So that, always seem, that seems to be a real problem. I'll, I'll, ask the, I'll answer the last question first, I guess. We're still struggling with it. We have not, we have not figured it out. Um, it's, um, it's a challenge. Um, these people handed us something and said, uh, and you know, we're changing the way the ballot reads. And I don't know if that's going to be the, you know, because now we've got the attorneys looking at it, we've got the marketing people, we've got the public relations people. So you know, I'm sure it's going to, you know, the ballot is going to probably be this big now. You know, <laughs> you're not gonna be, we have to get bigger boxes because you know, the slot's not going to be big enough to stuff Do, it in. Doesn't the, the ballot give them permission yeah, yeah, for yeah. you? Doesn't the ballot give them permission for you to contact them? That is the direction that they're headed. So some sort of permission that they are agreeing to allow us to reach out to them as a result of handing them. So that's that's the direction that we're going. Um, successful events. You know, it's tough. It's tough. First of all, it's tough to measure the, the success of events, right? Um, I'm trying to think. You know, anytime I can go to an event and I see people engaging out in front of the table, having conversations. Um, when I start hearing from customers, I was at this event, I saw your people, and I got to tell you, they were completely engaged. When I go out to prospects and they say, um, you know, they were at this chamber event, they're at, you know, you know who's doing a, a tremendous job of it right now? Investors. I am hearing nothing but positive things about if the people and investors. It's made me rethink who we're sending to events. You know, why? Because they're, 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 they're folks are everywhere, right? Are we seeing them? Right? Don't you see the, the, the people everywhere? They're everywhere. They're engaged. They're following up. They're focused. I mean, that's what it, that's what it's all about. So, you know, successful events. It's tough. It still is tough to get to to, to gauge. Uh, I worked really hard to put um, the TD Bank James Moody Democracy Jazz Festival together at New Jersey Pack last year, and um, that felt good. It, um, we had, but why? Because you know, we did events pre-show, after show, we did meet and greets with the artists, we did uh, a VIP party beforehand where we invited prospects and customers to engage. Um, where, where, we, where I find that there's value is where we're, we're, we're adding value. It's not just we're handing them a, a, a uh, here's our products and services. It's where we're building relationships. It's where we're, we're entertaining clients, but in a, in a fashion where they get to learn a little bit about the bank, they're engaged with employees, um, and I'm mixing prospects and customers when I do VIP events. Um, few customers and lots of prospects so that, um, and that's a challenge in and of itself, right? Managing the guest list, who's coming, who's not coming, I'm, you know, who your prospects are, who aren't your prospects, how do you qualify a prospect, right? And store managers, idea of a prospect is a little different than perhaps maybe a commercial lenders and everyone's got, so that's a challenge, but if you can, 
um, you know, if I can create events like that where um, they seem to be they're smaller but more meaningful, they're impactful, um, and people also um, we're doing events where we're putting clients, new client um, dinners or lunches. So instead of having the closing dinner that you would typically have with a client after you close their loan, you bring them and you and maybe the attorneys that closed it. Instead of doing that, we're doing a client dinners, a new client dinners. So we'll invite the CEO of maybe eight or nine new clients, go to a restaurant, typically a customer, because we actually do lend to restaurants. Um, and, and we try to put the groups together so that there's common synergies, right? So they're either in the food business or they're in something, you know, they're manufacturing, but along similar lines. So we're starting to help them network. Um, and that seems to have been, seems to be working really well because they can share stories, they can share, um, and we're adding value. We're not just the bank that provided them the loan, we're actually the bank that's now helping them enhance their business and do more business. I don't know if I really answered your question, but. Any other questions? When TD took over Commerce, Commerce's brand was phenomenal. Everybody marveled about it. Did, and it seems like TD is America's most convenient bank. Everything that Commerce stood for, TD. TD was big in New England. Did, was there any training of existing TD employees to accept that brand that they acquired? The, um, it was a huge concern for the bank. Right, we were merging it's really two banks, but actually three banks, because there was Bank North that was up in New England that had been acquired by TD about a year earlier, and then there was Commerce Bank um, that was mostly in the central part of the, of the states and down through Florida. And Bank North was 27 banks that had been acquired over 10 years. So for those of you who have been in that, <laughs> there's lots of cultures. There's lots of different ways of doing business. And, and, and their methodology and approach to customer service was not necessarily the same as ours. Ours, I hate to say that. So then there was Commerce Bank that had one model brand culture from you know, essentially New Jersey, New York area down. Um, but TD was, you know, it, it's an extremely well-run, organized, methodical bank. And what they were not going to say, I had been, you know, I, I was with United Jersey Bank when it became fleet. I was, um, no, um, Summit. I was with Bank of America when it became, uh, in that West when it became Fleet. They're all Bank of America. So I was on both sides of an, of an acquisition, when we were being acquired and when um, we were acquiring. And both times that I went through that, it was, it was real simple. They said, um, hey, you've got a great bank there that, that we just acquired, um, but, but, but here is your new policies and procedures. This is the way we do it at this bank. And they threw away everything that was good about the bank that they acquired. TD did not want to do that, so they said, we're gonna create the better bank. And that bothered me as a former Commerce Bank employee, the better bank. Why would I want to be a better bank? I want to be the best bank. We, we, were, we were Commerce Bank, we were the best bank. We were the... But you know, one of, the exec, one of my mentors took me aside and said, you're right, we want to be the best. But once you become the best, what's gonna happen? You're gonna rest on your laurels and somebody else is gonna become better. So we want to always strive to be the better bank. So what they did was they looked at the cultures of Bank North, of Commerce Bank, and up TD Bank up in Canada. And they said, let's take our time and let's create what will be our model. Now, a lot of the things, a lot of the looks and feels ended up being commerce. But in the end, it was because we all worked together to put it together. It wasn't that we went up and said, this is how you're going to answer the phone now. This is how, that's not how we did it. So by getting everybody's involvement and buy-in um, and creating what the model was going to be and then executing it, it allowed us, I think, to retain a lot of the great things that kept us or that, that made us America's most convenient bank. So it was a combination. Any other questions? All right, I thank you for your attention. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the New Jersey Bank Marketing Association. For more information, visit njbankmarketing.com. This podcast series is available for sponsorship. If you're interested, get more information at bit.ly forward slash content sponsorship.
We produce these programs in the studios of Lubetkin Global Communications in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at lubetkin.net. For everyone at the New Jersey Bank Marketing Association, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for being with us, and we'll see you out there on the net. Take good care.